Okay. Uh, thanks for uh, all of you joining the um, Philip K. Dick Talks. This our this is our uh, I guess our first uh, broadcast of many, uh, where our goal will be to um, interview and, and share with some of the prominent uh, figures in the world of Philip K. Dick or that have studied Philip K. Dick. Uh, and not only that, we'll be exploring the themes uh, that uh, impacted his uh, thinking over many, many years, uh, such as what does it mean to be human? What is the nature of reality? Uh, where are we heading? Uh, parallel universes and so forth. Uh, before me, I have a very special guest tonight. Uh, his name is uh, Richard Dollar. is a Philip K. Dick scholar and professor of English at uh, Penn State University. Uh, Richard Doyle is author of Wetware, Darwin's Pharmacy, um, Beyond Living, Fairy Land, and his most recent, The Genesis of Now. He's presented a very famous TEDx uh, uh, conference, The Exegesis of Philip K. Dick, Hacking the Hero's Journey Beyond Thought. Richard runs Radio Free Vallis, which is a is free uh, online webinar uh, exploring the works of PKD and Zebrapedia online, which is also an effort to transcribe the entire exegesis of uh, Philip K. Dick. Over the years, Richard has taught many courses on aliens, uh, Philip K. Dick, nanotechnology, William Burroughs, rhetoric, Sanskrit, the non-dual Bible, and everything in between. Richard was a uh, guest of us, uh, guest of ours at the uh, Philip K. Dick Film Festival in 2016. So uh, welcome back, Richard. Thanks so much, Dan. This is cool. I'm glad you're, uh, you know, catalyzing this. You know, just getting together groups of people well, to, you know, allow these ideas to flow is, you know, it's a beautiful thing. I think uh, there's uh, ever a time where we can... Absolutely. I think I think that uh, if there's ever a time to explore of uh, the message of Philip K. Dick, now is the time. Um, I think this is a very a lot of people have. Uh, well, I would say since 2016 specifically, I think they felt they've been thrown into uh, a parallel reality, and now with the uh, whole uh, pandemic uh, amongst us, uh, I guess it only adds to that level of. Uh, strangeness so uh, what if you are okay with this why don't we start there and see how this all relates to pkd how pkd would have uh well how he would have reacted to what's going on right now well i think uh, uh first of all uh just let me know if you can hear me because remember we started discussing kind of in the situation of uh Herbert von Fogelsang in the novel *Ubik* by Philip K. Dick, who goes to uh, consult his dead wife, uh, who's in chronic suspension, and they keep getting interference from some of the other uh, denizens like Jory. And in this case, I'm getting a lot of static when you ask the question, but I think that's perfect because what came through is this idea that what would PKD, how would he be reacting to this uh, current pandemic situation? I think first we would recognize that this was a fundamentally uh, ontological experience that we're having, that we're all simultaneously on a planetary scale being asked to inquire into who and what we are and the nature of our being because we're, we're recoiling from the shock of this kind of collective and very unprecedented kind of disaster. We're not, we can't quite put our finger on what has happened. We know that it involves uh, uh, an illness that is external to us and carried by nucleic acids and is thoroughly inert to anything without our participation. Viruses are not, strictly speaking, alive, right? They're as akin to a mineral as they, they really are to an organism. They need a cleus in order to make copies of themselves and so on. So I think Dick would have recognized first and foremost that the nature of the situation is just how strange it feels, right? And that Dick is constantly creating worlds that are slightly out of whack, as in Ubik, when 
things are aging too quickly and entropy is uh, accelerating. And so I think this sense of his being able to tune into an aspect of his own reality that he he felt was kind of slightly out of whack, out of tune, um, would be the sort of first way that he would probably approach what is going on right now is to just sort of help us not panic at the out of whackness of it. This is kind of that we're all experiencing a kind of uh, entry into what feels at first like a kind of negative psychedelic experience, right? It's like there's a kind of collective no, 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 not like this. See, the first part is that Dick would just say, yeah, relax, it's just weird, okay? It's always been weird. Weirdness was not just invented. I think that would be one of those that he would offer us after he himself went through a fair amount of panic. But the second thing that I think he would notice after he panicked was that one of the things that makes it so weird is that it confirms what PKD thought was um, kind of ontologically distinctive about human beings, meaning what is it that is peculiar and specific to our nature as a human being? As you mentioned, he was interested in what is real and what is human, and they aren't the same question. And Dick comes to the conclusion of the level of humanity, what it's real about being a human being, the essence of a human being, is its capacity is for empathy and the kind of... Uh, impossible avoidance of empathy or a a lack of empathy that so for example do androids dream of electric sheep where this is a central theme that that, that kind of uh that that the empathy our ability to feel the suffering and joy of another to identify with the interests of another as a result of that that's what we do with our minds but the feeling level is the empathy the pandemic is nothing other than a, a, a kind of experience of empathy for at least two reasons. One is that the social distancing that we've all been, as the Marxist philosopher Althusser put it, interpolated into. We've all been called on and told. It's kind of re weird combination of a command and a request, right? Please, to maintain social distance and to go into isolation, right? So as opposed to the rest of the time, when we're constantly the object of media that's telling us to go out and shop and chase ephemeral crap and lay up treasures on earth, as it's put uh, in the New Testament, this messaging has shifted, right? We're no longer being told that we can't be adequate human beings if we're not out consuming spectacularly. It's very strange for, because for the entirety of my life, that message has been building constantly, right? It's a kind of continual, ever uh, um, expanding and ever intensifying kind of soundtrack to our life is go forth, consume, labor. And now we get this different experience where we're told to let go of all of that. We're not exactly told to like what we have to do, but we're told what I think is fascinating and very hopeful about the present moment is that for m most of us, that comes not so much from a sense of obedience that we kind of want to obey the law, because like very few Americans want to obey the law, and I think that's a healthy thing. But because we feel that element of empathy, Pete Gaty was talking about, that we feel like I'm doing this not for myself, but for another person who is in danger. I'm doing it not just for my grandmother or my grandfather, or, you know, my immunosuppressed sister. I'm doing this because I recognize that I'm in a community with other people who are at risk. And then I'm doing that for their sake. It's a very beautiful uh, uh, phenomenon, in fact. And it, it, it relates to what Dick called ethical balking, he called it. Ethical balking. Eric Davis has written about this nicely. And Dick talked about when he was an undergraduate at Berkeley, he was in ROTC, and he could never quite decide if he got kicked out of ROTC because he broke his gun by accident, or if he deliberately sabotaged it, right, in an act of ethics, right, because he had this Quaker lineage, right? he had this pacifist uh, aspect of himself, he was very anti-war, 
right? Anti-violence. And um, he, uh, he always wondered, did he in fact do that out of a, of a sense of, uh, uh, you know, ethical cleverness? Or did he just screw up, right? You know, and this is sort of what keeps PK the human because on the one hand, he's thinking all of these, I think, very deep and crucial and vital thoughts. And even in the exegesis, I would contend he always gets over himself and stops taking himself so seriously and kind of has a laugh and says things like, well, the thing that horse lover of fat realized that is that he hadn't realized anything at all. Right, you know that he, all of his big, big theories go poof into a cloud of uh, you know conceptual smoke, and he says, "Look, all I have my emp empathic relationship to the world. All I have is what he called the respect for the eni of the other. The this experiencing of empathy, where he really could see even in a fly washing himself. He said, you know." this sense of that flies being and that flies being in the world and its vulnerability and its fragility. So I think PKD would, would want to kind of jam and riff on both those aspects. The first the weirdness, I just odd it all feel. Teach how to announce, because he would, he, remember, you know, he talked about how to, how he would create worlds that wouldn't fall apart two days later. But in fact, he reveals in that speech and in that text that he precisely creates worlds to fall apart so that he can watch what when they fall apart and ours is falling apart. I think that's the third thing that about. he would see that it's finally happening, you know, again, that the black iron prison, what he called the black iron prison, sort of egoic establishment of ownership and control and antipathy to empathy, you know, the penal state, you know, the prison colony of the planet that Dick saw the planet turning into the right. way. And, and it's a penal colony that we all have our own keys to, right? We can all be liberated from this penal colony, but we have to do it the same way he did by taking seriously whatever anomalous experiences we have in our, in the domain of consciousness and not just trying to explain them away, which in my humble experience, most critics do, even some of my friends with PKD's, you know, visionary experiences that many, many people line up to diagnose PKD and say, oh, look, he was crazy because he took his own subjective awareness seriously. And it's like, no. It's not crazy to take your own subjective awareness seriously. That's what thinking right. is, right? So I think that what's happening is the end of a period of time that we've been so capable of being distracted by this ever accelerating exponential attention feasting consumer economy, right? And we've been told to go on think against it. Now, of course, we're trying to dive online with the same fervor, you know, that we could bring to the external world. We're binge watching freak shows and, you know, tigers and so forth. But in my experience, for most of the population, that starts to exhaust itself rather quickly. And yeah. then it's what Blaise, you know, Pascal said, the fundamental problem of humanity, which is all of the problems of human beings, I'm paraphrasing Pascal, emerge from the inability of a human being to sit in a, alone and be with themselves. And, and many of us have with almost meditation. Uh, and therefore, we might turn to people like PKD, we might turn to whatever spiritual traditions we have access to and which don't freak us out, because it turns out that that work, which PKD is asking us to do, and he does with does in the exegesis, is difficult work, and it's the work of contemplation. Contemplation is not simply a kind of dazed, uh, you know, journey within, because the journey within is at least as difficult as, you know, this, right? 
guys called the Raider's Edge in Upanishads. And so what's great right. is you read PKD's exegesis, you read the novels, it teaches you how to do some of that contemplation because you do some contemplation with him. And that's that's why I wrote the Genesis of Now, uh, because I only came to reading the Bible from years and years of reading PKD and p plugging up my ears every time he would say anything about Christianity. I was all ears about the Taoism and the Vedanta and the Buddhism and the quantum physics and the parallel universes and the empathy. But anytime he started to talk about the Christianity, I just went, la, 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 la. You know, I don't want to hear that. I wasn't ready for it. Um, so, so that's what I think he would point to. He'd point to the fundamental strangeness. He'd point to the way in which, though, that strangeness had to do our sudden experience of our empathy being highlighted for us. Like anytime we see anybody in public now, we become kind of aware of our need to keep distance from them in order to be ethical, right? And usually when we think about ethics, we think of proximity. We think in order to be ethical, I need to be near someone. But in this case, we're being called upon, to, upon the, this ethics of giving space, right? So uh, I think that, that he would uh, really run with that in terms of a sense of uh, the importance of uh, giving space both to each other, also to this contemplative aspect of our own awareness. Let it, let yourself be contemplative. Let yourself observe. It's not crazy to gently observe the nature of your own subjective awareness. Otherwise, you're probably just going to panic at the weirdness, right? Which is, and you're going to double down on the different strategies that you have to somehow, quote unquote, control the weirdness. But the weirdness, by its very nature, is weird because it can't be controlled. We're all being, right. it's, all, it's being demonstrated to all of us that this fantasy we've been sold, that we're in control, is just that. You know, it's a fantasy that we've been sold. That doesn't mean that we're helpless or disempowered. It means this notion of control is a kind of cartoon version of human reality. And we need to learn to live, you know, fully in uh, the strangeness and depths and beauty of reality. Funny that it took a fiction writer to help teach us that, but it did. Uh, one night. Uh one uh, characteristic of Philip K. Dick was his always his questioning, his never-ending uh, skepticism to any one specific narrative. So I do know that there are some yes. people out there uh, that are uh, questioning the, the standard narrative, which is uh, regarding the origin of the virus uh, and so on. And I notice how the mainstream, it's really cracking down hard on them, almost as if they're holding on to some kind of truth which the other group doesn't have. I think Philip K. Dick would have, my take, he probably would have welcomed different opinions and different uh, angles as to what's really going on because uh, we're all obviously being told this is the way to do it. This is how we need to interpret reality. Whereas he was always urging people, or at least in his, his characters, to, to really question the nature of reality and, and the narratives that are socially constructed. Yeah. Yes. Well, again, you took up a lot to me, but what I got was the repetition of the word narrative and the need to question the narrative. And I think as a great fiction writer, Dick would have understood the reason we question a narrative is because it's a narrative, right? The words. Right. Not because there's some other narrative that is correct, but because we err when we forget that it is a narrative, right? So if um, you know, PKD was a, a very, um, I think, profound experiential philosopher. So when he asked the question, what is real? He wasn't asking it abstractly. He needed to know for his own experience, if that makes sense. And he, like um, sages in many different traditions, to therefore observe his own experience. He called this ultra-medical. Cognition. 
something. They observed it. And they have clouds that are blowing windows. Those come and go, right? That the women in his life, for example, they would come and go. His moods, they would come and go. His thoughts, his certainties, they would come and go. Even his sense of being horse lover fat or Philip K. Dick, they would come and go. His sense of promise, you know, uh, as a reincarnated uh, ancient Christian, you know, early Christian, that would come and go. And so he came to the conclusion that Vedanta and Plato, Shankara is the one in the Vedanta tradition, that what we call reality, material reality, isn't real. It, it's, it comes and goes. But now that's why we have to be careful with this language because a lot of people say, oh, well, if you read Phil K. Dick, he would tell you that the virus is not real. No, he wouldn't tell you. that he would say none of this is real it's telling me are you still hearing me yes yes we had a are i guess a moment me? of uh, interference from the other side <laughs> yeah jory jory was was having his way with us well i mean the point is is that Dick under Dick was able to find, I, I would argue, ultimate reality, the absolute, what he termed Brahman after the Hindu tradition, the unchanging. Yahweh, I am right. what I am. Precisely because he used discernment and looked and saw that everything that most of us take to be real just isn't. Right? So uh that, that, that means that he was uh, in accord with Nagarjuna, the Buddhist philosopher, says there's a relative level of reality on which we are embodied and on which we live and where things come and go. But there's an ultimate or absolute level of reality, which is the domain of, the, of eternity. And that our mind is capable of of understanding those aspects of eternity and in understanding those aspects of eternity, we can learn to identify more with eternity than we do with changeable reality, which makes us suffer, right? So that's where I think Dick would want to, I don't think Dick would be encouraging, you know, another narrative like a conspiracy theory. Right. I think Dick would, I think, think Dick would tell us it doesn't matter if there is a conspiracy or not. What matters is you're an empathic being. <laughs> what matters is you are doing your very best based on limited information to care for yourself and others, right? And that you have very good reason for thinking that on this level of embodied reality, that certainly there are um, vectors of disease that are transmittable within six feet. And then if we all just give each other space, and don't do a lot of the bullshit work that is bullshit work that props us up this economy so that we can consume, 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 then we're going to be able to save a lot of lives. Even if it's just from the flu itself or fewer car accidents or fewer suicides. Now, I recognize that we've built our economy around, you know, and, and a lot of bullshit, you know, which is a lot of avoidance of our lives and kind of, and so the point is to help our brothers and sisters and help us transition to an economy that was less devoted to bullshit. In other words, less devoted to the unreal. If Dick was going to focus our attention on what was unreal about our ecology, he would focus on that kind of consumer, ephemeral, celebrity, buster-friendly uh, culture that we're all being sold. That's what's not real. What's real is our care for each other, our need for care, right? Our need uh, for you know, the ability to uh, eat and, and uh, drink and have shelter and have health care and have something meaningful to do with our lives during a time of rapid technological change, right? 
I mean, this is why I think it's very interesting that less than two weeks before, you know, Congress signed $2.3 trillion of aid, you know, the first of much, um, in order to keep the whole machine going, the mainstream media used the word socialist to tar and feather Bernie Sanders. Now, I'm not trumpeting Bernie Sanders. I'm not saying, let's adopt the Bernie Sanders narrative. I'm saying that a narrative was killed through this term, this magic word socialist, only two weeks before what would be termed socialist that any president or any political party ever did, which is to provide trillions of dollars of direct aid directly to the economy from the government. That's the very definition of a socialist act, right? So I right. think what's interesting is, or and you could also you could also say that it's very interesting the way in which Andrew Yang's proposals, for example, during the political season when it existed, were treated with a kind of like ho ho ho, that's a nice idea, but it's kind of comic, you know. Let's laugh at it again. I'm not endorsing that and saying that's the narrative we should have, but the narrative changed like that. All yeah. of a sudden, why? Yes, we can give trillions of dollars directly to people in order to keep the economy going. That's called guaranteed basic income. So I think this is where Dick's thinking would also go, right? Because uh, he did, he was an anti-communist, you know, the end of the day, but he was an empath and he felt the need for human beings to care for each other and for us to build societies that at least approach caring for, giving a fundamental level of care to each other. And again, I would point to, I don't think illegitimately, some of his Quaker lineage there, where he was kind of rediscovering through a science fiction lens, you know, what the, what the Quakers would talk about in terms of the inner light or the inward word, that Dick's experience of the pink light was kind of, you know, postmodern William Penn. That makes, you know, like if William Penn had taken acid and, uh, written a bunch of science fiction novels about strange uh, experiences contained therein, um, then we would get Vallis. And that, that is what we get. And you know, it's nothing, it takes nothing against the way from the particularity and the specificness and the individual character of Philip K. Dick, because I think one of the reasons many of us are so attracted to Philip K. Dick, why we love him, really, and I think that that's where there's a kind of love that people have for him, is because it's impossible not to see his suffering and be empathic with it. We don't right. we don't say, oh yay, Phil K. Dick really figured it all out and he's the savior and we're all gonna be saved because he was saved. No. We watch Phil K. Dick and we see a mirror of our own suffering and we see how we get glimpses of how to get out of our own suffering. And we even get out of our own suffering for long periods of time. But it's also kind of like, you know, the, the scene in uh, um, Dwayne Droid's Dream of Electric Sheep, where in Mercerism, you're engaging in this virtual reality religion where you're climbing this mountain in kind of a Sisyphus kind of reenactment. You're climbing, 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 and you get rocks thrown at you. And the, the miracle is, is that the, even though the rocks are virtual, you get actual wounds, right? It's a kind of postmodern stigmata or virtual stigmata. And I think that's one of the reasons why we, we find PKD so authentic, because we say, ah, he's not claiming that the pain and the suffering goes away. He's claiming that we can find a way to accept the pain and suffering and to accept the pain and suffering of each other and to care for each other. That just seems so much more authentic than pretty much any religious offering I had ever come across, you know, but then I started to realize that some of Dick's investigations into Buddhism and Vedanta and Christianity and Taoism, they were also all driven by that fundamental empirical experience of suffering that he experienced that again, empathy, or even another word he liked a lot, agape, right? This state of love which is not a state that, that where there's no room for the self, 
it's not because it's virtuous. This is often, I think, misunderstood. Agape isn't virtuous, although it's a good thing to do. Agape is devoid of self. We experience pure love without any ego there to try to own it or control it or do something or take credit for it, right? It's just the act of selfless love itself. And so, sort of, uh, you know, I think unconditional love. Was unconditional, exactly. No strings. So, so, and because there's no strings, there's no self. That's what PK keeps rediscovering because the self is made up of those strings, those, those attachments, those hangups. And PKD is discovering over and over again how good it feels, how liberating it feels to let go of those strings. So if you want to know how to get out of the black iron prison, the way that Dick suggests is agape, right? Agape. And he says that in agape, he experienced what he called ultra metacognition because once he was clenched up and worried about getting what he deserved and not dying and being treated with justice and not being harmed, just gave it up, just loved. Right. Once he saw that he was actually able to observe the processes of his own thinking and saw that those two come and go. Right? So he didn't identify with this flow of his own thoughts. He wrote them down, but he, they didn't, he didn't think most of the time that they were him. And that's the mistake that most of us make. We identify with our flow of thoughts, and those come and go. And if we identify with right. them, sometimes we're going to be happy, sometimes we're going to be sad, sometimes we're going to be paranoid, sometimes we're going to be ecstatic. But if we can observe them in this state of selflessness that can come through practices of agape of giving ourselves totally to another and and through giving ourselves to another giving ourselves to god sacrificing our life letting go of it in any kind of a selfish way then we can experience these expansive states but that's what makes it so interesting that people want to line up and and diagnose pkd because PKD is really giving us recipes for what all of the world's spiritual traditions have tried to point us to. It's not right. crazy. It's, it's, it's our quest. So I just think it's really, really interesting. And it might be time for us to see that Phil K. Dick is not so weird after all, <laughs> right? <laughs> that the, the world ironically reminds us that, ah, uh, yeah, it kind of is like that. It kind of is like Palmer Eldritch that, you know, Leo Bolero realizes at a certain point that whichever path he takes, it's the wrong one. <laughs> right. Right. And and that the nature of being a finite being with an infinite imagination is to realize like, right. There's no good choice. There's only riding out and loving through being a finite being. Right. So that's why I think he would say now. And uh, that's why. Um, I was willing to read anything that he was pointing to in the exegesis because what did I know? Maybe, you know, I have to stop putting my fingers in my ears when PKD says Christianity things, which is what I was doing because I had kind of secular horror of Christianity, blaming it for the, understandably, for the conquests and all kinds of aspects of the Black Iron Prison. But PKD, you know, helped me see, along with a great little book called... Um, the Sermon on the Mount, according to Vedanta by Swami Ananda, thin little book. You can probably find a PDF on it. Oh, yes, yes. I saw that one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful little book. And it taught me how to tune into the Bible. And that's why I started teaching this class on the Bible as literature. And that's why I just had to write the Genesis of Now. It was like a, a you know, it was, it was, it was like, a, a auto, like a dictation, as it were. You know, I wasn't. I didn't decide to write the book. The book just started to right. write itself through the experience I was having. And, and can you, and can you tell us a little bit about what led up to that? Because I, um, you mentioned in the book that you had um, uh, you had a, some kind of experience. Um, 
uh, yeah. with the ayahuasca back sure. and that. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, well, so basically until uh, 1997, uh, I didn't, I mean, I had had sort of inklings of some kind of a, a spiritual aspect to reality, but I was a, uh, you know, intense, intense, uh, I mean, non-spiritual, but anti-spiritual person. And I was an anti-Christian person. And I was an anti, I was a scientific materialist that thought that everything was bunk, right? I loved punk rock. And I thought Zen Buddhism because it just told me that nothing was real, right? Uh, and because that was the year that my um, my mother died in 1997, 10 years after my brother suddenly died from a heroin overdose. And the ego death experiences that I had out of both of those deaths, um, I did not integrate. I was given a shock, but then I used, I coped by work the first time and then became pathologically and suicidally depressed the second time rather than with these kind of shocks, ontological shock that I got from both of these deaths. But in 1997, I did start to meditate just to feel better. I just started sitting spontaneously. And uh, out of that, a kind of process whereby I became aware that I was going to need to reconstruct myself entirely and bootstrap myself out of this suicidal, complete dark night of the soul experience. And part of that involved writing a book about the drug war because I wanted to understand, I wanted to revisit my brother's death because he died of a heroin overdose. And I thought that I knew that the drug war had at least in part been instrumental in my brother's death because it was our the odd way of dealing with intoxication that had turned this into a criminal phenomenon and led him to be, you know, a junkie working as a construction worker in Atlantic city who then overdosed the day before he was going to go to the rehab clinic again. Right. And, uh, right. of heroin and cocaine, a speedball. And so I, I think non-consciously I realized that I really needed to go back and do that grief work as the psychologists call it and investigate the drug war. And as part of investigating the drug war, I learned that William Burroughs in the 50s had gone down to Peru in quest of what he called the final fix um, through Yahe or ayahuasca, where he had gotten uh, the idea that perhaps Yahe would heal him of his heroin and maybe even indirect of his need of because it was healing him of his ego that right. he was going to be able to get beyond verbal thought, which was his quest as a writer was to exterminate verbal thought and get to kind of what he called the Western lands in his late work. So I knew I was going to write about Burroughs, but I didn't, and I, but I didn't feel right writing about Burroughs without drinking ayahuasca. And I didn't know how I was going to drink ayahuasca because, and, you know, go down to Peru because, I didn't have the money to go down to Peru myself, and I knew that the university was never going to fund it, so what was I going to do? Um, but by chance, I got to teach a graduate seminar at UC Berkeley as a visiting professor in 2002. And while there, I met a radio producer who was interested in uh, working together. And I said to him one day when we were having lunch, which almost didn't happen, almost missed the lunch, and all kinds of miscues occurred, but we actually met. There was a guy named John Rieger. And he's an independent radio producer. And I said to him, um, do you think NPR would be interested in a story on ayahuasca tourism? Because he was talking about pitching some stories to an NPR magazine called Savvy Traveler. So kind of like what, you know, pre-podcast, but it was radio. And he said, well, what's an ayahuasca tourism? He was literally what he said, which I thought was funny. And I said, oh, well, you know, it's when people from North America or Europe or Australia or cosmopolitan Peru or Brazil, they go into the jungle and they drink this ancient 
mixture of plants with a curandero or curandera, and they they uh, experience this incredible psychedelic state. And he says, "Oh, that sounds fantastic. Let's let's do that." This guy was the uh, high school roommate of Jeb Bush and was himself an oh. experienced uh, psychonaut. Mm. And one thing to another with this remarkable coincidences constantly. And we ended up four and a half uh, hours by boat out of outside of Iquitos, Peru, which is the jungle city you have to fly to or take go by boat. Um, and, you know, I thought I was the smartest person in the world because I was getting paid. I had a contract to go down and quote trip balls, right? You know, that I was getting paid to go and take drugs, I thought. But the joke was on me, as I've said many times, because I had no idea the kind of ontological reality that I was opening and the nature of the healing that I was surrendering myself to. And I went to Peru uh, very sick with uh, asthma and whole body eczema and atheist and secular, and I came back healed of the asthma and not secular. And then through continued shamanic practice, I healed myself of the whole, I was healed of whole body eczema that was quite severe so that a lot of people didn't recognize me anymore after I was healed of this. And so this experience was, as you mentioned, kind of eye-opening as it were, that my view of the world turned out to be totally and completely wrong, right? That that nothing I had in my worldview prepared me for the possibility I could be healed this ancient jungle medicine, this Native American <clears throat> jungle medicine that's probably, you know, that's thousands of years old. And then I did so through interactions with a realm that is ontologically experiential, more real than this one. Uh, and in a highly participatory and lucid way. So I had to somehow integrate that knowledge into my life back in North America. And I even asked the ayahuasca to please help me learn how to integrate that shattering ontological opening and healing experience and share it with other people such that they might also be healed but also so that I could live in this strange consensus reality that's been concocted out of all kinds of falsehoods for whom Phil K. Dick is a, you know, key guide. Um, he's like a Beatrice through our, you know, postmodern purgatory. He, he guides us through the realms of the simulacrum. Right. Uh, and uh, so what ensued was, the past uh, now 18 years since 2002 of ongoing spiritual opening, metanoia, healing, humbling, letting go practice of learning how to contemplate and discover my true nature and learn how to share tactics for other people to discover their true nature and to do that together. Or like we're doing right now, because as far as I can tell, there's nothing better to do. Um, and and so the that's work. Why, how I let it, how, sorry. Uh, how does then the I'm work, sorry, uh, the genesis of now? Yeah, uh, the genesis of now. How then is that? Uh, how did that become connected, or uh, become, or the next step in your experience? Yeah. Yes. Well, what happened was if I were to integrate this ontologically shattering experience, I needed, just like PKD dealing with his own ontologically shattering experience um, of Vallis, you know, 2374, I began this kind of mad quest to open all of the doors to all of the sages in all of the uh, global traditions that might, that might be able to help. And I didn't do that intentionally. I started on this apparent wild goose chase from, you know, 
Brother Lawrence, the great French monk who wrote the text, The Practice of the Presence of God, which is one of the finest kind of spiritual instruction manuals I've ever come across. And I had, you know, the Sufis uh, and Titus Eckhart and Ivan Arabi. And uh, I read the Taoists and the Tao Te Ching. And I, I tried to learn the Chinese for saying the Tao that can't be named is not the eternal Tao. And so, and I was the kind of fervor and love that I was kind of devoted to this stream of knowledge that would help me have an understanding of myself so that this healing that I'd been graced with and healed by not only wouldn't go away, but would be integrated into my life such that it would be shareable. And then I would understand it wouldn't drive me insane, right? Is it really a way? How, how could this have occurred, right? Like my ordinary world could never have allowed, couldn't make sense of that. It just would, I couldn't ever go back to the old vision of reality that I had. You know, the Bhagavad Gita says, na nivartante, never to return. You can't undo that, shit, as we might say. So as the last thing that I was the most... Uh, probably uh, resistant to was, as I said, the Christian tradition, the biblical tradition, you know, Judaism, I was open to, and I read Rabbi Shlachter, Sh Schlachter uh, and some of the, uh, um, uh, Sholem, uh, Walter Benjamin, the Jewish mystic traditions. Uh, these I found fascinating, the uh, Kabbalah, Ein Sof. Um, but you know, something in me was resisting going to Christianity because of that scar. I'd not been raised Christian. I wasn't raised in any tradition at all. I said no to confirmation when I turned 12 or whatever in the Episcopal Church. And I was the third child. So they said, okay. It was 1975, you know. That, not, I'm not interested. I thought it smelled in church. I was interested in seashells in the beach and, you know, uh, uh, paramecia and, water striders, things that were alive. You know, that's what I thought was miraculous. This other, this incense smelling, you know, heavy cloaks, candles. No, no, thank you. So, um, so it was the furthest thing from my interest. But when I read the Swami blah, 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 uh, Swami, <laughs> when I read the Swami Prabhananda book, uh, somewhere on the Mount according to Vedanta, which used to be advertised back in the magazine Boy's Life, which is the magazine that I grew up wow. with, which is like how to make little kind of slingshots and things, other things that you could hit Philip K. Dick's windows with from that place where you had the, uh, your gathering in Santa Ana, you know, blow guns right. and bolos, you know. Uh, but I read that book and I literally, I smacked my forehead and I realized it was a yogi. He was a... It was practicing extended consciousness, and it was that practice of extended consciousness that led him to agape. And people were like, oh, well, Jesus had some secret method of tripping. Yeah, he did. Agape. Meditation. Right. Maybe he used plants, but he didn't. I don't know. Maybe he went in and he didn't. I don't know. It doesn't matter. What matters is find your way to expanded awareness so that you can open to that space of agape and experience that ultra metacognition that Dick, that Dick is trying to teach us to have so that we can see what we really are as opposed to what we've been sold. We've been sold that we're isolated, egoic, consuming units who are naked and afraid and frightened and about to get sick, right? But that's just the narrative, as you put it earlier. I've never, like, of course, have, has sickness been in my life? Absolutely. But it only works as a narrative if the I, if I am sick, or I had the shingles when I started to read the book of Job, or I, you know, probably had COVID-19 two weeks ago, or, you know, now you're giving the experience something to attach to those strings that we talked about the I, the I, me, mine. Uh, it's 
very prominent in the Sanskrit tradition, but it's just as prominent in the in the biblical tradition I've learned, right? So blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. That really, blessed are the poor in spirit means blessed, blessed are those who have let go of their ego, right? And that's something that so, a lot of people have forgotten, feeling that uh, the, all, the only the worthwhile traditions are the ones of the East. Well, they don't realize that the West had some and still has some very strong spiritual uh, currents, very strong oh. spiritual traditions. Oh. Uh, it, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's in folk shamanisms that even now exist in central Pennsylvania, where I live, where people just get together practicing things they've been practicing for hundreds of years that come from old Amish and Mennonite things that they, right? And Right. The Bible is full of all kinds of recipes we might call esoteric, but they're only esoteric because you have to practice them to understand them, right? They're parables, right? They're not just things to be believed or disbelieved. They're things to do. So, yes, yeah, so the, the West, every tradition has them, but we can't, a lot of we can't see in our own tradition because how we have received that tradition is so overdetermined and oversold, right? We've been sold an institutional version of Christianity, obviously. Um, so, and Dick was in many ways trying to find a non-institutional version of Christianity. Now, I don't agree with um, um, Gabe McKee, who I like very much, and I like his book very much. You should have him on sometime. He's there in New York. Uh, okay. Um, God, the light in the gutter, you know, God and the light in the gutter. Um, his little book, which is really a nice book. Um, he essentially, I think I might be misremembering, but he always wanted to sort of establish and say, well, PKD was a Christian. But I mean, if you say that, then you have to like avoid all his Taoism. You have to avoid his Vedanta. You have right. to uh, avoid his Buddhism. That's why I end up saying, you know, PKD was a perennial philosopher. But PKD at the end of the day was just PKD, you know. Right. And he was looking, he was opening every door. And that's what I did. I did the same thing. And when I got to the Bible and I stuck through the coincidences, I had to train up and teach a class on Bible as literature. The person who teaches it here at Penn State, the friend of mine, he passed away. And it was around the time where I was really opening to these these traditions. And um, we needed people to teach gen ed, courses, like courses that would get a lot of students in them. And so I said, oh, I'll, I'll study up and I'll teach, by, you know, intro to the Bible with literature. So I, I think I think I think I took five years of study and did like I taught myself a doctorate in biblical mystic in, in, in history of Christic. Uh, Christianity and mysticism. And, you know, there are other PhDs that you could do. Um, but what the reason I trusted it, the reason I trusted myself to go and teach it then was because it was, it, it was forged out of practice that I myself started using the exegesis of the Bible as an important part of my spiritual practice. And then I would find places that worked for me like Psalms 4610, which is one of my favorites that was also a favorite of, you know, another one of my teachers, you know, in my tradition, Ramana Maharshi, the, the great Indian sage who wrote the perfect little book just called Who Am I, Nan Yar. And one of the only Bible passages he knew growing up, and he had a spontaneous moral awakening experience when he was 17, was Psalm 4610, which is just be still and know that I am God. And that's not a passage that asks us to, it's a passage that asks us to practice it. It just asks us to get still. Still. And that takes Finding that space. I think we're coming to the end of the hour, Richard, but I want to make sure that uh, the people who will be watching this have access to some of the uh, your work. And so what I'm doing, what I will be doing here, to those who are, we have, uh, the first one is metanoia.press. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Right. So 
Um, in the genesis of now, I, I wanted to make it, uh, you know, very available to people that if they would read it, that it would approach, like, be something like the class that we try to make together, that I make with my students, and that much a part of. They, they honestly teach me at the end just as much or more than I am. But I'm trying to potentiate in them their own inner teacher. I'm not trying to tell them what to think. I'm trying to help them learn how to relearn their own spiritual practice. And, and in that book, there's two, the words are probably metanoia and agape. We already talked about agape, that Greek term for selfless love. But metanoia is the Greek term that wrongly gets translated in the King James Bible as repent. And what it really repent. means is have a change of mind. You know, turn yourself inside out. <laughs> Realize right. that what is inside inside and the outside is the inside, as Jesus says in the Gospel of Thomas. Realize that what you thought was true is false, and what you thought was false, your own objective experience, is true. So have a change of mind. And that's what occurred, you know, in my own life and continues to occur in my own life. So Metanoia pressed effort to create... Um, a, a, a channel, sort of like what you're doing with PKD, but a channel for books and discussion to emerge that are addressed to people who are primarily, probably, hope, even hopefully, not academics, but are part of what I like to call the lay intelligentsia, the people who are curious and fill their rooms with books, no matter what their job, they might not be able, they, it's very hard to get paid to, to do actual curious inquiry, right? And so I wanted to create a space where books got published by people who were in that domain and read by people who are in that domain. So the first book was Genesis of Now. That's now since been sold to another press called New Sarum Press, S-A-R-U. It also really highly recommend the British press where they produce some really amazing and beautiful books. And then the second book on it is this book written that I wrote with some of my students uh, called uh, Looking Upside Down at Nothing. And I shared the Amazon link with that. And that's just, right. it's not, that's, it's my, there. Yep. that's zany, it's fun, it's to read. But just, I would, I would, if it's only 99 cents, I would give it away for free if I could, but Kindle won't let you. And the, the print copy is very beautiful, but if you just keep reading it, most people report it's very fun. It's very lighthearted. Mm. It's kind of like a, a little dream. It's a little zany dream that you have when you read it. But you can't give up. You can't just like say, oh, I don't get this yet. You just got to go along and let yourself be a little bewildered. And you start to enjoy yourself. And you start to uh, let go of a lot of the stuff that you thought was really important. Because you just get trained by the the, the, the title character who who's the reputed uncle, the reputed nephew of Yogi Berra. And he wow. teaches us to just look upside down at nothing, right? Sounds like a really good- a really beautiful practice. Sorry? I think people, people will definitely benefit from that now. Yeah, it's just a fun little thing, you know? And then we got a book coming out by this amazing genius from India who's only 20 years old. Vidor Mishra, it's called the Info Boros. That'll be out in the next three months or so. That's like, good Lord, what is that? Like, that's quantum physics meets mystical first person experience meets uh, Indian uh, guru philosophy through an obvious, awakened, and brilliant and kind being, Mishra. Uh, and then we have a book on the horizon about ayahuasca and a kind of another kind of zany book about ayahuasca by uh, somebody out on the West Coast, beautiful Iowa skate. Can, and can all book on the about this very, uh, guru from Florida in the 1970s named, uh, I think his name was uh, Sexagena, Sexagena Genesis. Sexagena and, Genesis. Uh, there'll be more about that coming out soon. Thanks for the time, Dan. I appreciate it. I hope you were able to well, hear what I had to say. Thank you, uh, Richard. Uh, hopefully we'll um, have a part two because I'm sure there's, a, there's so much to talk about here.
Um, again, uh, for those who haven't uh, seen it, the Metanoia Press is one. Um, you can catch uh, the Genesis of Now. You can buy it from Amazon. Um, you can also. That's right. Yeah, Amazon is the place. Exactly. Pretty much Amazon. Pretty much Amazon. So Richard, feed the Amazon monster if you want to be heard. Absolutely. Um, well, but I we'll, really appreciate it. And, remember, and what about Zebrapedia? Static is part of the message. Zebrapedia is that still uh, running, or did you merge it with another? That's with still another? active. That's, that's still active. No, that's okay. still active. Thanks to thanks to Max Spiegel, that's active. So I encourage people to go and fool there or not fool around and be really serious. However you want to do it. Get, get Just get ready to be lost in the wonder. Well, thanks a lot, okay. uh, Richard. Yeah, you have a good day. Stay well. Stay safe. We'll, and we'll talk soon. I will. And keep in touch. And let me know the next talks you're doing because I want to hear what people are saying, okay? Absolutely. This will be posted in a couple of hours. And we'll be... Um, uh, both on YouTube and on uh, Facebook. Now email me too at mobius at psu.edu. Okay, give and me one second. I'm going to write it right now. pretty quickly. Mobius. Uh, can you spell that again? At psu.edu. Okay. psu.edu. Okay, we have a good one. We'll talk to you real soon. Bye bye. Well, folks, thanks for coming. Uh, this has been a very interesting, very revealing talk by uh, PKD scholar Richard Doyle. Uh, please uh, subscribe to our uh, YouTube channel, uh, which I'm having here. Um, where uh, that's the link, and also on Facebook. So uh, let's keep the current alive. Uh, all of you, stay well and stay healthy. Over and out.